possession crucial from this. How much longer will the referee allow? Dublin lead by a point. And there's the whistle. It's over. It's over. We earned it by winning the last two matches on the road, and that's not going to be taken away from us. But what I love in Hurland, I love players that will never give in. He hits it. He hits it. Right. It's over the bar. Hello, welcome to the RTGA podcast. Mikey Stafford here, joined as always by Rory O'Neill. Uh, later on, David Tuberty, new RTE pod- pundit, will be here to look ahead to round two of the Allianz Football League. But right now, uh, we're going to talk Hurling League with Michael Foley for Sunday Times and Jackie Tyrrell. How are we, everybody? Very good, Mike. Good. Mikey. Good stuff. Um, and they're great to be here on the eve of another exciting Allianz Hurling League season. Um <laughs> The tournament that <clears throat> nobody wants to win anymore, um, it seems, after what happened to poor Waterford last year. So I'll start with a very philosophical question, Mick. What is the Allianz Hurling League? <laughs> what is it to you? What is it to me? <laughs> is it anything at all? <laughs> if an Allianz League hurling match happens and there's no one at it, has it actually occurred? So all this kind of, yeah, I don't know. It's got that, you know, I suppose in, in common with the Football League and in common, in, I suppose, to some degree with the club championships as well. It's unique in world sport in that, you know, public mass interest in the competition diminishes us, diminishes us the closer you get to finding out who wins the thing. So it's kind of very odd that way. But look, it is it is what it is. It's 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 a product of modern hurling structures. So I think it's a product of how hurling is played now to some degree as well um, and how teams are preparing and stuff like that. It You know, it was funny. I was even, cons- you know, just thinking over stuff for the newspaper on Sunday and I was thinking about overviews, previews, whatever you want to call them, and going, there's not the preview, really. Because, I mean, it's, you're starting from the start line. We've had, we've had the warm-up leagues and whatnot, the Welsh Cup and the Munster League and whatnot. But, I mean, they are, in the current setup, like, they are absolute glorified training games. Like, these are the warm-up games we're going to watch now. So, I mean, it's very hard to preview warm-up games, which, you know. <laughs> so, it, but you know what? The one thing about the league always, <clears throat> regardless of how, how, how teams approach it. And sometimes we can get tied up in that a bit. Like players are going out, you know, a lot of them will be, well, they're all competing for places, but some more than others. And some matches will take on a life of their own and you'll get some barn burners in the hurling league. Uh, and okay, you might walk out of the ground after going, that was brilliant, but what did we really see there? <laughs> but you'll have got 70 minutes of, of, ent- of entertainment. I think that's I mean. all any of us can expect, uh, can ask for or hope for is 70 minutes of entertainment. As you said, Shane McGrath, um, our new hurling columnist on the RD website, kind of said as much. He said, just appreciate going on to the match. And, you know, it might seem like shadow boxing one week and you go to next week, Jackie, and it might, as Michael says, it might be a barn burner in February. Look, you won six of these things and we all know Brian Cody, if there's two flies, you know, climbing up the wall, he'd back one and he'd back it to the to the death. He's not there this year. We'll get onto that later. But the league obviously meant one thing for Kilkenny, whereas um, back then, not that you're that long gone, Jackie, but it does mean something different now. And there's two reasons for that. There's the fact that the championship is now a league, which is the obvious one. And there's also the fact that in 2020, pretty much the 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 counties at the top of the hurling tree decided they didn't want any jeopardy in the hurling league. And they did away with the Division 1A, 1, uh, 1A and 1B structure where basically the top six teams were in 1A and then the next six teams were in 1B. Um, a structure yeah. that didn't seem to do Limerick any harm. Limerick were in 1B for years and kind of built the team that they have now in 1B. But it does seem like the league has been has its fangs taken out of it. And it, it even now, it doesn't seem like the competition that you won six six times. No, it, it's a completely different competition, Mikey, and it's like chalk and cheese if you think back then. There was nearly a month of a gap between league and the championship, and in some, some situations even longer. You had the round robin, which is just hugely demanding across the Leinster and Munster uh, championships as well. So it's a different hurling landscape, and the league is treated completely different. The only thing about this year is that you have five or six new managers coming in, so that will obviously... Guys will be out to impress a little more than other years. Um, it's a clean slate in a lot of situations. You think of like massive counties like Cork, Kenny, Tipperary, uh, Dublin, Watford. New managers, uh, clean slate. Everyone is really eager to impress. So there will be a small bit, I'd like to think, a little more uh, urgency among, among teams. Look, I don't see Limerick approaching it any different than last year. It didn't do any harm last year to them. But it's definitely, it's definitely a different competition completely. It's not the league that we know about, the cut and trust of it. Um, it doesn't exist. You will have the odd 
game that will throw up. I know Kilkenny and Tip will be saucy enough. I know probably there'll be other there'll be other games that will just throw up kind of subplots that will just have local rivals going at it. Um, but I think in general it's going to be watery enough, and it's probably something that we need to look at. And I know Rory did say something before, which I thought was was intriguing that there should be some accountability for the league connected to the championship and maybe a performance based. Uh, league that that resulted in maybe a, a, an extra home game for you in the round robin, something like that, that you could incentivize and have something on the line for, for league. Because I suppose, and look, we can't blame Lee, Lee, Limerick for it. Limerick approached the league la- last year, they got exactly what they wanted out of it, they just retained their status. They were fresh, they came in, they won the All Ireland, they won three in a row, and they're going for four in a row. And I'd say they'll even do the exact same and maybe even pull back a bit more from that. Um, mm-hmm. And they will just be looking to maybe unearth one of the Cotton O'Neill's, Colum Cochran's, Adam English, push them on a little bit more, give Keen Lynch and Peter Casey a bit more game time. I mean, the whole of the year is, still, is not even in the country. You know, that just kind of tells exactly where, you know, Limerick's head is, head is at. Um, anytime we had a whole of the year, whether it was Larks or how they did be flogging themselves uh, come in January. So that just kind of shows the difference, the difference of the hurdle landscape. Yeah, and, and, and the thing is, Mikey, if you look at it, I mean, I remember when Eddie Brennan was in with us before he decided to go back into management. One of the things he said to me was that Ned Quinn, and I'm sure Jackie might attest to this, Ned Quinn used to often make a point to the Kilkenny dressing room in advance of the league that, look, if Kilkenny were to go out and win it, they would obviously make the pot, which is sizable, available to the team for a team holiday fund at the end of the year. And I think it's around, I don't know, is it like it's quite a substantial figure to win the league, I think it might be 100,000 or something like that. But the the reality is now, if you look at the spending that teams are currently engaged in, like, I mean, I think Limerick last year was a 2.2 million, somewhere in that, I mean, sure, like 100 grand is almost something they'd lose running for a bus at this point. So you, 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 you there's no incentive. That's only a couple of commemorative jerseys yeah, sold and like, they're done. You know, there you go. Like, <laughs> you know, so there, there's no incentive really to go out and show your hand. Um, it's probably, you know, bereft of in, integrity in terms of the competition itself. And you just really don't know what you're watching. The only way you can do it is incentivize it. And I think, look, maybe one of those options could be an extra home advantage or play all your, like, let's say the, the, the team that gets to the final plays all their matches at home. The team that finishes runners up gets an extra game. And all of a sudden teams might start to take it a lot more seriously then. But I don't know. I mean, maybe it's the case that the league is just reverted back to the way the league used to be, which was a glorified warm-up competition, and people are happy with that too. I don't know. Mm. Well, I think that's I think that's a fair point to make. I mean, you know, Jackie is right. Obviously, it's it's changed in terms of the competitiveness and stuff from from we say fifteen years ago or so. But I mean, you can go back 20, 25, 30 years, and the same sort of. Um, you know, world weary cynicism would be applied to the league. Yeah. I mean, there was a time in the late nineties and the noughties when Tip and Galway just seemed to be in every single final, and they'd go down to Limerick and they'd kind of tip off each other a bit. And I'm sure, I'm sure there's Tip and Galway lads listening, going, "We weren't tipping off each other," but it, it felt that way, and that was hmm. that was the thing at the time. And I, that's always been the way with the league. And to me, that's that's a product of hurling itself. It's such a small ecosystem. There's only hmm. so many times you can get yourself up to you know, to be at the right pitch to play one of the top teams, one of your rivals. And there's only so much that you eventually become conditioned to this idea that we'll, we'll do it. We'll do it maybe today because it's a good thing, but we mightn't do it the next day because they're, you know, guys are, guys are building towards championship. So it's, it's a product of hurling, not having a middle class. It's Correct. a product of hurling, having a, a very, a very, oh. very wealthy class. And then, yeah. A gap, and then the have another gap, if you like yeah. another mm. gap. So yeah. that's so it doesn't. In, on one level, it doesn't matter what you do with the hurling league; you're always going to have this issue of competitiveness. But I think what Rory says is true. At, at, at some point, people have to accept it is what it is. It's a warm up competition. Mm. If you want your, if you if you want a competitive championship in this in the form that they have it now, well then you're going to have to accept a league that's going to be watery in places. Like I've covered a few hurling league matches over the last couple of years, and I've been bored at most of them. But it's the nature that that's the nature of the beast. Another day you could go and it could be terrific. And you're looking for stuff like, you know, you're looking for players coming through. I mean, the likes of there, you know, Ruben Halloran, for example, in Waterford will say, you know, did very well in the Fitzgibbon Cup last night, hitting freeze for Waterford in the warm ups. 
Like, you'll be going along going, oh, what are this fellas like? You know, and there'll be others. Every team will have them. What, what are these fellas going to be like? Or, or what, what kind of way will they show up at sort of the 60, 70 degree level? And then some days, as I say, to go up to 80, but it'll come straight back down again. But that's the nature of the beast. The real, as we've all said, I think, no, the real, the real round robin starts in about 10 or 11 weeks time. And that's, that's where it's at for all teams. But, Most but should, teams we, anyway. should, should we scrap the pre-warm-up tournament, which is the Wilds Cup and the Munster League, and stretch out the league and start it earlier and give, us, give the players more time between league and championship so that they can go a little harder at it? And some way, some way incentivize it so that, you know, there is some link between your performance in your league and the championship. So it takes that element of fear away from managers going, well, we're only finishing the league final and you're two weeks out uh, into a Munster club or, or a Lencer uh, campaign. Give them four weeks, give them that month break where they can, they can down tools for a while, they can maybe go on a training camp and give them that breathing space where they can go a little harder at the, at the league and do incentivize it. And you will find that... Managers will go a little harder, and players will probably go a little bit harder. At maybe you were at that point. Yeah, I do wonder if starting the league in Jan- uh, earlier in January or in January would do much for its prestige either. Though would be the problem. But maybe I we I think we me and Rory have been talking about this for three or four years. Scrap the O'Byrne Cup, scrap the Walsh Cup, scrap the Munster League, and Rory always comes back with the argument that it's actually worth a considerable amount of money to the GA. It's the insurance fund, it is. Rory, is it? <laughs> It's, it's the, the benevolent. Accidents. They're yeah. they're bene- it's the be- they're the benevolent fund competitions. And what people will say is, look, oh, there's loads of money, but sure, people are talking about dispensing with Allianz Football League f- football finals. They're talking about they've kind of, you've already downsized. And your... Eddie Hearn won't pay for Katie Taylor. Yeah, so like, where's the money coming from? You've, you've already downsized your main cash cow, which is your inter county season. We saw last year the All Ireland hurling final, uh, despite what we might be told, was not a sellout. You, you could get tickets for the All-Ireland Football Final on the day. There, I would suggest, given the report will be coming out this morning, actually, and it'll be very mm-hmm. interesting to see what way those finances are in Tom Ryan's report. And I'd imagine that the Garth Brooks, um, get that the man with the Stetson has probably saved the day. But the more revenue streams you switch off, the more you've got to find money elsewhere. So if you turn off those early season competitions and you effectively flip them into a bunch of challenge matches, which is what teams will do anyway, you stop people from going in gates. You're then going to have the same kind of costs attached to inter-county preparation, which are getting into, like everybody was under the impression that by downsizing the inter-county scene, that the costs associated would reduce. But in fact, from what we can gather now, obviously you've got to take into account inflation the converse has seemed to be the case. So I think you've got to be careful here about switching off one tap and making sure that the other tap over here can actually fund what you want to do in a long-term, mm. a long-term context. Right. Let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about the actual... T- not the matches. We won't get too much into the nitty-gritty of that because as we've just made abundantly clear none of it really matters but look we're interested as Mick says we're interested in how these teams develop towards you know the the other league the league that matters and Jackie I think we do have to really start uh with Kilkenny because they are without doubt the most interesting team for most neutrals this year because it's the start of the Derek Ling era they're away to Antrim which last year, Brian Cody's last year, was a humdinger of a game, as far as I remember. There was... Um, K- oh, Kilkenny... We remember, we remember. It yeah, didn't, appear, it didn't, escaped... appear in, uh, didn't appear in Alliance League Sunday, and they were quick to tell us. Oh, yes, <laughs> well, you know, the reports we read in the written press with, you know, the, the stencil drawings and, you know, the wood engravings and stuff told us that it was a, a cracker, a lot of goal mouth incidents, um, which is obviously... Like, you know, it's the league. Antrim, Antrim are one of the teams who will take the league seriously, Jackie. So it's a nice first test for Derek Lane to go up to Corrigan Park um, against an Antrim team who have considerable injuries themselves. Now they're missing Conor McCann, Kieran Clark, and a few more. So you take them out of that Antrim team. But they have the Dunloy contingent yeah, back. Right. How do you think, Jackie, Derek Ling will be approaching the league? Well, first of all, I think Derek is taking the team over in a really good place. And fairness to Brian, who left him in such a competitive place where they really went at Limerick last year and are in a really good place to take it on uh, underneath that I suppose Mikey Carey has left the panel that's gone travelling Connor Brown has, has left gone travelling as has Richie Lahey Derek's approach to the league like most of them all considering he had that success with the under 20s last year will be how many of these lads can he bring through can Billy Billy Drennan be the man up top for us? will the likes of 
a Garo Dunn, could he feature, could be an impact off the bench. So he will be really unearthing all that talent and giving them as much exposure as possible, particularly because he will give the Ballahale guys a bit of a break. TJ will get a long break. I see on Cody was back last night playing Fitzgibbon. He'll probably get an extended break. So and there's there's quite a good few of those there. But then the likes of Dara Corcoran, who's who's been had a really strong campaign for Ballahill, I'd imagine he'll come straight into the in, into the team and see because he's he he could be a really option a good option from a, a wing back. But he probably has a lot of things to manage. The the Richie Hogan, TJ Reid, a lot of miles on the clock, the integration of the under twenty team. But essentially it's a new era for Kilkenny. And subsequently to what people would think with Brian and his, his, his lack of movement with tactics, throughout last year, he did start to use the ball an awful lot more short. He did start to retain possession an awful lot more. So it'll be interesting to see, does Derek continue with that? Does he accelerate it a bit more? I did go to a couple of the Walsh Cup games and were really, really poor. It was hard to see kind of, you know, what any kind of style of play Derek was trying to implement. So it's, it's going to be a wait and see. But you couldn't have a better guy position to take it on from Brian. Has been in there as a selector for a couple of years, went back to the outstanding job with the 20, has featured with his club in the management role as well. So he's in a really good position to take that on and has brought in his under-20 selection committee as well. So there's a good bit of continuity there. And what's what's the mood around the county, Jackie? Because I suppose those of us on the outside, the only... They're the only comparison really we have are, you know, everybody's probably made, well, I at least have drawn a comparison between Alex Ferguson and Manchester United and how, to an extent, maybe people think Derry could have been Brian's choice as well. And, you know, the whole get behind your manager, David Moyes, Alex Ferguson and the continuing shit show that is Manchester United ever since Alex Ferguson left on the outside. Not wishful thinking by any means, but just that's kind of people would be thinking, was Cody... Like everybody knew he was a fantastic manager, but was he more than a manager? Was he the glue keeping the very structures of Kilkenny hurling together? And with him now gone, is everything going to fall asunder before our eyes? Well, I like to think Kilkenny and Manchester United are worlds apart in so many ways. And <laughs> I would like to think the strength of Kilkenny was Brian Cody and the Kilkenny County Board and the structures that have stood the test of time. So, and, and Derek would be really, really, because I played him, would really be a player's man, very approachable guy, would be able to get in amongst them, talk to them, get his arm around the shoulder of some lads, give lads a kick in the, in the backside if they need it. Um, so, but I'd say, I'd say he won't change, he won't rock the boat too much. I'd say it would be a, a continuity of a lot of the things that Brian has done, and he'll slowly start putting his old slant on his style of managing and, and this group. Um, and you know, I suppose if you're looking at the learnings of the under 20 and what he did with them, he did have in Billy Ryan a kind of a linchpin of an inside man that they did go along from time to time and he was able to win his own ball. So you could see how he would use that maybe in a TJ Reid role, TJ maybe a fourth team and work the ball through the lines, which much further than maybe Ryan did uh, in, in his latter years. Okay. Um, moving on to Cork, seems we have two Corkmen with us. Um, Mick, there's probably a couple of things kind of kind of popping up, I think, in, in the build-up. Uh, first of all, I think you had Mark Keane named to play centre-back in a Munster League match, um, and then before the match was played, it was announced he was going back to Australia. And then this week you have the, the you know, the talisman of Cork Hurling, Patrick Horgan, kind of airing the dirty laundry to an extent kind of thing. Now, in mildly kind of saying, you know, he didn't think he was fairly treated under Kieran Kingston. And I would say, you could live at Kieran Kingston's house and be his son and maybe not think you get a fair crack and whip for Kieran Kingston. So I don't know if Patrick Horgan really has... Yeah, I don't think if, he's, if he was treated particularly unfairly by Kieran Kingston. I don't know how you feel. But um, Pat Ryan, there's a fair bit in his inbox, shall we say. Yeah, I, look, I think, first of all, I think the reaction to Pat getting the job in Cork was very positive. Mm. Uh, very, uh, a lot of satisfaction that he, that he got it. He's a very capable coach. Very good CV, good, good record behind him, good guy, um, mm. and probably the right, the right personality, the right kind of, kind of person to go in there now. Um, as far as the the, the, the Patrick Horgan stuff goes, look, I think it happens, and I'm not saying it. I don't know the ins and outs of it. First of all, um, but I mean, I think when you get to that stage of of Hoggy's career where he's at, having been such a central figure for Cork for so, so many years, and also being so wedded to the game. Um, this is a guy, I, you know, I, I know anybody who wants to play at the level that these guys are playing at have to be ultra committed and all the rest of it. But this is his life. You know, hurling is absolutely his life. So I would imagine that, that uh, losing his place would have had an immense impact on him. 
And when you're at that age, you know, you know the years are running down and I I just going to say crankiness comes can can kick in with guys at a certain age if if uh, if they just can't quite get to where whatever manager who's in charge wants them to get whatever they want him to do. Um there's no doubt that again with a new manager coming in and with Cork going through a historically barren spell, you know, without an All-Ireland that 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 Patrick Horgan has still has a role to play there just just in terms of setting standards, um, you know, bringing guys along, uh, being a comfort blanket almost to younger players coming in to know that he's there, you know. Um, so, look, I've no doubt that, look, I, I, knowing the little bit that I know about him and, and the little bit, and, and, and all we know of him from watching him down the years as a player, he's going to have, there's going to be a reaction from him this year. So let's see what that looks like, first of all. But I think overall, I think there's a, deg- there's a very good degree of satisfaction that the right guy uh, has, has come in and taken charge. Um, and again, they're at the start line. Who knows? They got water for, or sorry, they got Limerick, I should say, on Saturday night. There's a handy two points. It, well, you know, you just don't know what you're going to get. You really don't know what you're going to get. Like, I mean, they won the Munster League. It's funny as well. Like, I, I watched a few clips of the final against Tipperary, and um, and there were actually Tipperary scores I saw more so than car scores. But I mean, some of them were terrific. So, I mean, even though, again, even though we're not sure what we're going to get, kind of rustiness in 2023 and sort of you know kind of waddling into the league is a di- it's a different kind of waddle from 2003 and 1993 you know i mean the standard is still going to be pretty high so it's it's different guys are at a different you know they're going to be ready to rock to some degree so you just don't know what you're going to get i mean i i would imagine i mean cork have been of of I mean, all teams have suffered i suppose under on un, under limerick's reign over the years but i think cork more than most, perhaps, have have suffered <laughs> a little bit, given that they've had to meet them so often in Munster and then in all Ireland finals and things like that. So, uh, look, it'll always be something. But we'll see. I wouldn't be. I wouldn't be ruling out a, a big performance from Cork and Saturday night at all. Yeah, Rory. Um, we have uh, we have the former RT pundit derby then as well on Sunday with uh, Davy Fitz and Michal Donahue going toe to toe. Um, there's you'd imagine there's probably more expectation. Uh, more pressure on Davy, considering the crop of players he has inherited, and Dublin perhaps maybe some people feel are kind of treading water in the last couple of years. So, but Michal Donahue, we've seen what he's done in his one previous inter county job, he had a pretty phenomenal impact. So, it's um, this game obviously won't be written about in the annals come July or August, but it will be interesting to see how both set out their stall. It, very interesting from a water for from both t- teams' perspective, but the two of them actually have a bit of a rivalry going back to when they were in, they were in charge of Galway and Wexford respectively, because they obviously came across each other a little more often in the Leinster championship, as well as some league games. So they're obviously wearing different color banished door bibs this Sunday. Um, I think from the Waterford's perspective, we'll probably see a couple of a good few new faces given the, they lost a few players to travel and uh, retirements, and we see Park Man, you know, has exited stage left as well. <clears throat> I, f- looking at the Dublin team through the Walsh Cup, he has more or less gone with the tried and trusted in a lot of the key positions. He's still kind of sticking with a lot, and like, and there's the bones of a very good team. I don't know if Chris Crummy is back on the scene. I think he might be out again. Oh, he is. Yeah, 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 which is a huge blow. I mean, just in terms of leadership alone. But um, it'll be an interest. Like the Waterford are always an interesting story. The approach to the league, Davy loves to win everything. But I suppose the big thing from their point of view is given the fact that they were pulling up trees and went down and won the league so spectacularly last last year, and then tanking in the championship. Does that temper the ambition somewhat? Or does Davy even care what happened under Liam Cahill last year, and he just goes in with his own agenda? That's going to be the interesting thing to see from a Waterford perspective, I suppose, on Sunday. Sorry, Rory, I was just going to say that Waterford there. Uh, it's interesting like that. You know the way when All-Ireland winning managers win in All-Ireland, there's a tendency in the GA to kind of mimic what what worked or at least to mm. look and see what we can take. There'll probably be, that's another, that's another kick in the teeth for the league is that, you know, there'll be a look at, well, what happened to Waterford last year? And is there any value to us even, you know, going that, yeah. going that way? But and I think Cork. Cork made the league final. And yeah. you could probably say 
you know, didn't really have a good championship either. Not you know? great. So, so, I mean, again, though, you're probably looking, I mean, 2021 or 2022, I should say, we could be looking back in years to come and go and your know, teams are still trying to figure out how to pace themselves through it, mm. through such a short season. But like Waterford are missing an awful lot of players. And mm-hmm. Dublin, I think, are missing a lot as well. I saw a number the other day. It's like 10 players missing off the panel. So, it, 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 you know, t- t- the game could be a kind of a funny one. But I mean, you know, I mean, Waterford have already set out their stuff. I think the, someone was telling me yesterday, like the underdogs game, the very first game they played a sweeper, like against the underdogs. So, I mean, I think, I think we're not. Start as you mean to go on. Exactly. I mean, I think we're not, we're going to get their, their, their training very, very hard, uh, apparently at, at the moment. So, um, we'll With see. With Donald Cole Callahan encouraging them in the background. Yeah, they're all, they're hanging off zip wires and all sorts. Yeah. <laughs> um, We'll, we'll leave it now in a second, but Jackie, I'd be remiss of me not to mention the Walsh Cup final, uh, which is taking place on Saturday evening between Wexford and Galway, which is also doubling up as the first round of the league. Um, but you, you watched a bit of the Wexford-Kilkenny game in the Walsh Cup. You were impressed by Richie Lawler, and I'm also impressed by Davey, or by Henry Shefflin's effort, I believe, in the Walsh Cup. He used 37 players, so uh, Henry knows should have a fair idea what he has in front of him. So his experimentation has begun, but you would imagine he'll be refining that throughout the league. Um, so, uh, yeah, Henry in year two, he certainly didn't, he didn't settle on his starting 15 in, in year one anyway. So the, uh, there's, there's, a, um, it seems to be a lot of development left to do there in Galway with, with Henry. Yeah. And I, I would say looking back on, on last year, the one, the one huge learning that Henry will have taken, if you look at the All Ireland semi final where they came so close to Limerick, they just lacked that punch off the bench to get him over the line. Whereas Limerick were able to bring guys on um, and finish the job off. Galway didn't get that punch. So they'll be looking to unearth new talent. Uh, Johnny Cohn has obviously stepped away and retired from it. So he's obviously another option that's gone from them as well. So that will be his big focus. Uh, can he get more lads that contribute and that could maybe even start? Are definitely coming off the bench because that stood out so much to me last year. I was at the All Ireland semi final. The, the same kick wasn't there in Galway when they needed lads to come off the bench. I'd say Henry's quite comfortable. I'd say he knows 12, maybe 13 of his starting 15 already this er- early this year. Like he has a lot of stalwarts there that are in really great form last year. If you think of the Mannions, you think of Joseph Cooney, you think of Dottie Burke and all that. I'd say he's quite comfortable with those guys and he intermittently pays those guys in. But he just needs new talent that he can have confidence in. That when they come off the bench, this lad will lift me a point. This lad could do me a job. Um, so I'd say Henry will continue. I'd say he'd probably be one of the most experimental managers in the league, and I know they all will be. So I'd say that'll be the big thing for him. As regards Wexford, I watched I watched the game on um, uh, the Kilkenny game down in, in Wexford Park. What an occasion for a Welsh Cup we're on about getting rid of it. But I suppose that fixture just stood out on its own for. The, how attractive it was but I was really impressed with Richie Lawler and Connor Devitt at cornerback as well Wexford probably had an awful lot more um, mainstay players playing that day but they have some guys that are after slotting into different positions and look very comfortable this early in the year so um, I said Dar Egan will be quite happy with what he's got out of Walsh Cup so far um, and look if he can get a win the weekend as well it obviously gives him some confidence as well going into the, into the rest of the league well, the fact that he had the Rex and he had the O'Connors, these were lads who were planned on going travelling, and I think they were they were let off to Sydney for a few months in various places. But I don't know whether he went over them with himself with a couple of Canadian mounted police and rounded them up or what. But anyway, he seems that the lads who were going travelling, they went travelling, but for not as long as was immediate it was initially thought. So um, he's um his powers of persuasion seem to be good at least at least. All right, lads, seems this is our league preview show. Um, for the crack at least, I'm just going to ask you who's going to win the league, Mick. Um, he throws he throws a number of darts at a board and see what one's left Um, I don't know Claire pin the donkey yeah Claire a good good call Rory she said I don't know about Claire I think they I don't either (laughs) (laughs) Jesus Rory don't critique his choice fucking hell give me a break like I just think yeah. like, you, you, I, was, I think Clare are going to be very interesting actually this year given I suppose in many ways they were the team that pushed Limerick the closest in that epic uh, Munster final and I'm just wondering what the priorities would be for Brian Lowen in year three um, in terms of he's got a very mat- reasonably mature panel and I think maybe he's you know but it's I wouldn't be surprised to see Waterford going to back to back I think Davy tends to take the league very very seriously and um yeah, they're 
<laughs> you just don't know. I I go for Watford. <laughs> Jackie. I'm going to go for a team that traditionally don't really do well in the league. Um, but I'm going to go for Cork. Um, I feel, well, that's the death knell. Know, that's the death knell now for Cork's uh, ambitions for I, the year. <laughs> I feel the young lads there, I think they have the best underage talent coming through with young Toomey, mm-hmm. young O'Connor. Um, I think they. I think if they get on a good run, the Patrick Horgan, I think, is very interesting. I know we touched on I've never seen so narky in all my life. And look, mm. they say as you get older and, and you get near the end, you get a bit narky. But if you can manage that, like, yeah. like his comments kind of surprised me. Um, yeah. And I remember last year we did the game Cork and Galway last year. And he scored a goal and he did some sort of a celebration as if he was kind of silencing his critics or something like that. I think, yeah, I think it was that, Rory. I just kind of, mm. I, and I, I have met him a few times, a very classic guy. From to do that, I thought, God, he's, he's, he's really keyed off, you know. So I think if you could harness that, that, that could really bode well for Pat Ryan and it might get a nice tune out of Patrick Horgan this year so that's my call This is all very disturbing Mikey I was listening to <laughs> something there last week and there was there was Kerry footballers big enough the Cork footballers now we have Kilkenny Hurlers big enough the Cork Hurlers this is all very disturbing <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm going to go for Tip because I don't think Liam Cattle will learn his lesson from last year and I think, I think <laughs> he's got a yeah, he's 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 got Tipperary hurlers, you know. Jackie won't big them up. He can't big up Cork and and Tip at the same time. Tip is a good call, actually. Tip yeah. are a good call because I mean they won't be. I mean, for all that all their troubles last year, they have they always have good talent and yeah. they do yeah. traditionally. If there's a league to be picked up, and Kilkenny haven't won it. Tipper, Tipper, always good to to slide in and get one. So you might be right there, Jack or Mikey. I I could be, probably not. It could be Galway, <laughs> could be Leash, could be Antrim, could be Westmead. Who knows? Um, but sure, we'll have fun. We might learn something, and we'll see a couple of good players. And sure, as we said, that's all you can ask for from the league. Um, Jackie, thank you for that thankless task of previewing the Allianz hurling league with us, and uh, we'll chat to you soon. And we will be back in a moment with David Tuberty looking ahead to round two of the Allianz football league. Uh, we're back uh, to talk big ball, and we've been joined by former Clare footballer David Tuberty, and as we are obliged to say, the top scorer in the Allianz Football League of all time. So no better man to look ahead to round two. How are you doing, David? Not too bad. No, all good. Good stuff. Welcome aboard. I think you're uh, one of our new shiny pundits, and I think we we might be getting the first bite of you. So I'm I'm we're happy to have it. Uh, we'll be nice to you. I promise. Delighted to be on. Yeah, we'll start. We'll we'll start with an easy one, David. I, the whole country. I don't think even just GA fans. My wife now would have zero interest in GA, and every time she gets a a push notification on her phone to do with Glenn and Kilmacud Croak, she's quite interested because she just she just wants to know how did this happen? Why has it got this far? And I'm like, really, there's a there's a thesis in that. Um, it's it's a hard one to explain. Um, from the point of perspective of a player, David. Um, from my point of view, looking in having never played at a level where I was challenging for all Ireland titles. I'm beginning to question the motivation of either of these sets of players to replay this match. I know they won't be saying that publicly, but geez, whoever wins it now, it's it's hard to look at it. You won't be like looking at your medal with pride in 20 years time, really. You'll only have one one <coughs> overriding memory of this whole affair, wouldn't you? I will, yeah. I think it's um, it's been a bit of a farcical at the moment now. And um, I suppose to GA, I suppose the only thing that probably should have happened was a GA coming out on a Monday and Tuesday and saying, listen, this is going to be, we're going to replay the match. And I think that would have sorted everything out. They should have just put their foot down and said, right, this is it. Um, but looking back at it now, if it goes to replay, if Clean win the game, like you'd be saying, right, it'd be kind of tarnished because it'd be like, well, you lost the first day. But um, the only thing that probably would be 100% is if Croaks play the replay and come and win it, then they'll have, there'll be no argument there. But um at It'll the moment, be the greatest All Ireland ever won because they'll have had to win it twice. Twice, <laughs> <laughs> that's the thing. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, I, I don't see it. I don't see a replay happening. I am. Um, I don't know what's going to happen, but I don't see any. Te- I think the two teams playing it. No, um, we're we're recording this on a Thursday morning, and uh, by all indications, Mick, there will be an appeal lodged by Kilmacud this evening. They will more than likely lose the appeal because the Central Hearings Committee nearly always back up the CCCC. And but there are in, uh, there are indications that if they go to the DRA, there's a chance that Croaks will win. But this is all speculation at this point, yeah. and it is an unholy mess. It's a right 
mess. It's amazing, isn't it, what breaks through, though? Like, this is a very, this is not, like, I mean, well, I know it's an All-Ireland final and stuff, but it's it's not a unique situation in the GA, unfortunately. I mean, there's been officiating screw-ups like this in big matches <coughs> down the years, but yet this is the one that's broken through. It's kind of mad. I I find that kind of the strangest thing. Why do people this. care so Why much? Why do people care? Like, I mean, and that's that's not to belittle the issue. It's just, it's just a, kind of a, I don't know what's going on. Like, it's, it's, because like, Whenever the whenever we get an outcome here, let's say the match is replayed or not replayed, it, let's say it is replayed, I would imagine that the amount of people that are fascinated with the outcome now, there won't be a percentage of them watching the replay. Like. Oh God, no! No one cares who actually will be the All Ireland champions, and much less no one cares how the GA actually deal with the yeah. lessons from this Sh- small Mick, there's a out. there is a bang of saipan of this what is driving this is the fact that you've got two diametrically opposed schools of thought it's very simple it's very simple thing to explain it's live line classic i don't think it's hit live line yet which amazes me uh i'm amazed <laughs> that disgruntled from stalargan hasn't been on or some loud roar from Mahara. i'm amazed but it, here we are angry I, from sandyford Angry from Sandyford, <laughs> discombobulated from Dundrum. Like uh, it, it's it's just it's it's strange. But like it, you know, it struck me looking at it last week. I mean, this similar things have happened. Like the two thousand and seven All Ireland Club Final. Like John McEntee was sent off in that match for Cross McGlynn against Crokes. I managed to stay on the field for a fair length of time before he was eventually substituted. <laughs> So they kept 15 men, but Crokes didn't appeal it and went away and they lost by five points and that was the end of it. I'm not saying that that's what, that's what, Kill, or that's what Glenn should have done here. Or by rule, they were well within their rights to appeal. And I, like David said, I, I, I would have thought that it would have been great if there had been a kind of an effort on the Monday morning to get yeah. the main hitters in the GA together, the head of the CCCC, and also Kill McCudd and Glenn on a call and go, let's... What, this is this is these are the options. How how can we move this forward as a unit? Now, having said that, I understand to a degree why the CCCC in particular mightn't have moved because in all things GA, you look at precedent, and precedent here is to set step back and look and see what the clubs want to do. Because if you move too fast, the clubs could rear up on you and go, "Oh, we didn't want to do anything. We didn't want to, re-, you know." So there needed to be, but the fact that it broke into the mainstream, I think, yeah. is what does it for me. Like, there are people out there looking at the Gino going, they can't even run a, their own, one of the biggest competitions in the country. What the hell are these people at? And we can go on about all the nuances and all the stuff as much as we want, but that is a perception that's out there. And if there's a perception that the GA could have nipped in the bud, regardless of precedent and regardless of their fears that, well, if we get involved now, every Tom, Dick and Harry are going to be appealing results and appealing all sorts of stuff. Sometimes you just got to grab the nettle and and be very clear in your messaging and be very clear about what's going on. But unfortunately, the way it unfolded, I, I think both teams were kind of railroaded almost in a way into the positions yeah. they've taken. And I'd agree with Dave. The most interesting thing I heard last week, and I just can't quite remember. I have an idea who said it, but I just don't want to say it in case I get it wrong. But there was a there was a former Derry player on a radio show, and he made the point that he had spoken to a Glen official. And his sense of it was that they wanted to make they wanted the appeal to occur. They wanted their point to be made, but that would do them, that there would be no replay. That's what and the sense I get. Nobody really wants to play a replay here. They yeah. really well, it's, don't. it's a mess. Like, I mean, if you look at it, I mean, I mean, it was the most clubby thing ever. I think one of the reasons, one of the weekends that was proposed as a possible rematch date was ruled out because <laughs> of the wedding. And then another weekend was that none of the stag. And I was like, this is, hang on, no. on the one hand, we're, we're really? proclaiming this as the biggest club game, senior club game in the country. But on the other hand, there's a we stag. can't do it because there's a wedding on, right? <laughs> it's the most G club situation we're going to Newcastle for the weekend. ever come across. You'd be like, oh, God in heaven. So, like, I do think, I think there might be merit. I think there could be a bit of both here that it may well go as far as the DRA. There may be an outcome. And then mm. maybe both clubs or Glenn or whoever go it's going to leave it. I think though, Mick, if it went that, like, eh, 
I'd find that slightly exasperating. I think if Glenn, oh, so right. You know, like, <laughs> I, 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 to my mind, there are three avenues open to Crooks. The first one, which is the one that obviously is a lot of hearsay, which is, oh, we'll send the cup up the road. And I find that very contemptuous. Oh, that's, that's a very yeah. contemptuous I don't think that's, uh, I think that's attitude. Temper, right? I think that sounds like temper to me. Yeah. yeah. So like that, the first one is you down tools, refuse, refuse to play and let the chips fall. The yeah. second is you engage in the process and you appeal. And if you take it to the DRA and then you accept whatever findings they bring. And if that's, a, if they are, if they stick with a replay, then you play the match. The third, which is the one that I'd nearly favor the most from Crokes's point of view. And if I was in there as part of their committee, I'd be pushing for, just play the match, play the match and get that awful, that awful American phrase around um, psychotherapy, closure on the whole thing. If you, yeah. and, and I feel, I, I would argue <laughs> that whether they win or lose the replay, they will feel better than the way it is right now. I don't know. A lot of them are off on their holidays as far away as Australia, if you, re- <laughs> if you believe reports. So I don't know if they're, they're too yeah. bothered about it. Um, but it's it, a very it, dangerous precedent from a judiciary point of view, though, to have a big game like that come to... Uh, hugely dissatisfactory conclusion if because look the reality is as we know something like this It'll probably happen again. will happen again. <laughs> oh, was at a game. I was at a game last night at, over in Abbottstown. UCC were playing Mary's and it was geez, a fantastic competition in many ways. And the game went to extra time and penalties, but I was looking at it right. So there were both teams made eight substitutions and on a couple of occasions in extra time there was subs that had come off or coming back on each one was having to hand a slip of paper to the referee that's 16 slips of paper he was handed over the course of the 80 83 84 minutes 16 slips of paper so every time someone was coming on now i don't know if that needs to be still the case at inter-county level it probably isn't because you've a fourth official it's a lot of butchered but, Irish. But, but but it's still 16. <laughs> it's still 16 different people coming on, coming off. Yeah, look, the chance, and that, that the point is, I suppose, this could happen again. And yeah. I think from a GA perspective, they just need to try and tidy it up now as best they, yeah, the best they a, can. It is a little reactive, David, but it is the point a lot of people come back to is that if you want a mess like this to not happen again, one way of doing it is to in some way look at how substitutes are done in GA because the funny thing is I play junior B hurling a substitution takes place the same way there as it does in a top level you know Allianz League match or whatever or you know uh, it's and it can it can get quite chaotic and I'm sure you've played in matches where maybe you've been subbed in the 74th minute because it killed time or you know your teammates are coming off because you know it makes sense to kind of just kind of slow things time down rest, a bit yeah. That's perfectly within the team's rights. You have an allocation of substitutions to make. And people are arguing, well, if you did it in a more formal way, it would take even longer and would disrupt the game further. So there's a balancing act here for the GA and it's a hard one to strike, isn't it? It is. Actually, it actually happened in uh, our uh, our quarter quarterfinal against Derry. I actually came on as a sub and for 40 minutes, we had 16 players on the pitch. <laughs> Or 40 oh. seconds, sorry, 40 seconds. I'd say 30, 40 seconds. We'd actually, no, it didn't do anything. I don't think we got a score. <laughs> score in that time. But actually, it did happen, Jesus. yeah. So, <laughs> so in other words, it, you know, it does happen quite easily. It does, and yeah. Happens, and, up, happens against Derry teams quite a lot, <laughs> by all accounts. <laughs> yeah. but I, I, the funny thing is, I was watching the um, uh, the linesman who was at the, at the Clare Lout game at the weekend now, and they had a new thing where, um, well, I don't know, it must be a new thing because... If there was a sub made, the the, ref, the linesman had the flag up in the air. Mm, mm. Um, he was holding it right over his head, yeah, and yeah. he waited until that player came off the pitch, and then he dropped the flag when the, when he came off the pitch. So, the referees must be uh, trying to clean up their act after the, the last <laughs> the last uh, the we'll see, final. We'll, push, we'll, um, we will see how long that lasts. Yeah, um, that's it. Yeah. Well, look, it's it's a mess, and it's it's a long way from finish. I think, as you know, any um veterans of such affairs know we've we've a fair few acronyms to go through before this thing finishes up so let's um let's look ahead to round two of the alliance league then and um actually we could we'd start with news uh, well news related to claire i just heard there um kieran Byrne has been confirmed he's after suffering a second acl injury um obviously he um suffered the injury against claire there last weekend so he's obviously out for the season and that's rough for for him personally. It's the second one in his career, and also Connor for, Sweeney. 
Yeah. Connor Sweeney as well, yeah. Mm, yeah. yeah. And uh, Burnham obviously be a, a key key player for Louth. Um, so that's that's a serious blow. Um, but on that match, I suppose um, <clears throat> it was a phenomenal comeback by your lot, uh, David. Um, you know, kind of definitely looked like that match was lost and kind of to win it with basically the last kick of the game um because it was already being seen as a relegation four pointer i think everyone's fascinated by division two and you no better man than you to tell us how does one stay in division two for the pretty much the duration of his inter-county career because it's it's a hard thing to do it is it's tough and i suppose we were we were lucky um the first few years that we went up um i think the first year i think we only stood up stayed up and uh score difference um uh, the following year as well, I think it was just a draw we got against Armagh above in Nuri, I think, that kept us up there as well. But um, no, it's it's a tough, tough division to stay up in. Um, I know you, you kind of, Claire at the moment, they're thinking, I know Colin Collins' mentality and the players' mentality is that they're looking at promotion this year. And that's, I suppose, they've steadied the ship in Division 2 and um, they're looking for promotion. But um, you, the first game was was crucial against Louth. Um that was a big four point or four pointer for Clare. Um, they got out of jail big time. Um, I think Mickey Hart will be disappointed the way the things finished. I think the ref, I think there was six minutes on the clock or seven minutes on the clock when uh Darryl Bohannon broke the ball into Pierce and Pierce popped it to Jamie Malone and no better man to pop up at the last minute of the game to to kick the winner. Yeah, yeah. Well, I I haven't heard an objection from from Lev yet, so <laughs> <laughs> we 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 might get away with that one. Um. Mick, it is though, um, Division Two, you know, the standard probably, I think Kieran Wheel made the point here last week that you look at the Kildare Dublin game against some of the games in Division One and like he, he reckons you could see a difference in intensity, a difference in speed. But in terms of intrigue and just kind of tension, Division Two is the place to be this year, isn't it? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. I've always, it kind of has always been, has always had an intensity about it because, you know, the lines, even before it was linked to Talchin Cup and all the rest of it, like, you know, <laughs> it's a big difference in getting relegated to Division 3 and getting up to Division 1, you know, so you're kind of in that, you're in that in-between phase of the of a team's lifespan, you know, and staying there, staying there takes a lot of guts and you have to have a certain mentality and, I mean, Clare have been tremendous over the years uh, in terms of just digging out <coughs> results uh, when they need them really really impressive down the years um it, it, so yeah so i mean but division two is interesting because dublin are in it uh it kind of feels like the margins are even finer because you're everyone's assuming well the dubs will and will Derry, you could argue uh, Derry to a degree but i think i think Derry, yeah like Derry would be my pick certainly straight off the bat like to to come in behind them but you never know i mean st- i mean as I said, like Claire are well capable of, of 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 getting a couple of results that you may not on paper expect. That's the case every year, to the point that you kind of half expect them to get them. <laughs> no, you know, so it's kind of okay, where, where, where will they take them out if we're talking about Claire? But um Kildare, uh, yeah, I mean, Kieran is is correct. Like, I mean it's division two football, like it's not division one, so there is going to be a difference. But um, you know, Kild- Kildare will look at the game against Cork at the weekend. No, that's that's a massive game for both teams in terms of where they go next. Uh, Meads will be Meads. That was a good result for Meads at the weekend. Yeah. They appear to have played very, very, very well. Yeah, like in the scoring goals and a bit of freedom about them. Um, we'll see how that works out. No, when they come up against tighter defenses later on in the again, we're at the start of a thing. So in a few more weeks' yeah. time, teams will be at a different stage, and you'll see. Oftentimes, you see it with Ross Common in Division One for teams like Ross Common and, and that it's important to get a couple of results on the board early. Yeah. Around this time, before your Kerrys and your Dublins and the stronger teams will say in Division Two get up, get up to a certain speed, uh, because you usually see in the second half of the league things start to pan out a bit differently. But uh, so you know, from the point of view of Division Two, getting getting your results on the board now is massive. Low, they're in a very tight spot now. Like Limerick, Limerick were with Derry for a lot of that game, I think. Uh, but it was a towards the end that pulled away. But again, you will be looking at other teams when they move on. Um, where will the likes of Limerick be at? You know, will they be able to keep pace with? But well, they've Dublin their, this weekend, so like L- Limerick are really they're getting their yeah. pain out of the way early on. Well, like I mean, it's you funny don't. actually. You know, when you look at Cork, I mean, Clare will target Cork, Limerick will target Cork, Kildare will target Cork as a, as a winnable match. You know, 
So I mean, they're every, the ones. Every, everyone was yeah. target shot. <laughs> they're all target shot. <laughs> so they're the ones in the middle, and it could go either way. Those matches, the matches that involve Cork, could be crucial actually in mm. terms of where a lot of teams end up in this division at the at the end of the day. Yeah, um, Rory, it, it does seem to be like you know when we listen to Wheelo at the weekend, like they they're obviously away to Dublin or away to Liberty this weekend. They're, it's not a hiding to nothing. Obviously, they're expected to go up, but. I think people will be expecting more than results from Dublin is kind of the impression we're getting already, isn't it? That, you know, it won't be enough for Dublin to win these Division 2 games. I think people are expecting to see something more to kind of offer some kind of optimism for the summer, which should kind of be inbuilt and expected with Dublin at this stage, but it is a strange year for them, I suppose, to be outside the top tier. Very strange year, but I, I, I would hazard a guess that a big part of Desi Farrell's thinking is to try and put some class of depth into his panel. I mean, yeah, we right. saw last weekend, they're still very reliant on their key players. The, you know, Brian Fenton, uh, Conor Callaghan maybe didn't have his greatest game. First time back for a long time in an inter-county jersey. Um, James McCarthy will have to come back and Jack McCaffrey, obviously. But the thing for them is, I'm not entirely sure if you're going to see them, like for instance, this weekend, like there's, there's absolutely no point in Desi Farrell putting these guys out against Limerick. What's he going to learn? What he probably needs to do is to see if numbers 19 to eight, 17 to 20 can actually give him some some options so that when injuries occur to key players as they inevitably will especially with an aging side given the fact you know if you look at the profile of James McCarthy Michael Fitzsimons all of these players so I think that's going to be a key thing for Desi we might see a largely experimental team again this weekend but the interesting thing from that point of view is some of the guys that he is throwing in there They've been given a good few chances now. It's not like these sort of players are new. We have seen them in championship and league games over the last number of years. And, you know, look, I suppose they're not really of the same standard and quality that Dublin have been used to maybe reeling off their production lines. So I think the more games they get, maybe he might get, you know, he might pluck somebody we haven't seen Kieran Archer for a couple of years what's gone on there um Aaron Byrne obviously came on you uh, the other night again you know did he make much of an impression didn't have a huge amount of time to do so so I think from Dublin's perspective that is once they get a couple of wins like the key key couple of games for them is kill their mead win those they're more or less guaranteed to go up regardless of what happens against Derry because they should beat everybody else and then it's really about injecting depth into the panel as much as they possibly can with a view to later in the summer. Because, look, the reality is they'll probably coast their way to a Leinster final again, which will guarantee their Sam Maguire qualification regardless. Yeah, it is interesting, David, isn't it? Because I think all of us, there was a lot of hand-wringing, there was a lot of kind of concern that, you know, Dublin's population growth, funding, etc., all those hoary old chestnuts have been discussed, meant that, like, Dublin's kind of, production line you know of like generational talent was ensured that it would it would happen year on year on year on year and I think it was Maliki Kirkin wrote a piece last weekend kind of saying they haven't produced a top class inside forward since Conor Callaghan and Conor Callaghan is 27 this year you know like Conor Callaghan's nearly playing inter-county football for a decade and there's nobody who's come along to kind of challenge him and Cormac Costello and Dean Rock's primacy you could say and it is unusual, isn't it? Because I would imagine you and all other inter county players were kind of saying, you know, the the, the you change. know the gig is up, the the jig is up here. Like these lads are just going to kind of keep producing these players every year. And as Rory says, it it hasn't quite worked out like that in Dublin. They're still a fantastic team, but the the spine of their team is the spine they had six seven years ago. You could argue. It is, yeah. You you don't see much coming through, really. Um, I suppose. Um, you still relying on the old diehards there that were there for the the one the, the six in a row and stuff like that. And usually what um I suppose Colum does here in Clare, he gives the young fellas a chance, he throws them into the deep end in the National League. And that could be a thing for Desi if he um I think this is a great opportunity for him uh, to throw the younger players in in the deep end into the national league and see what they see what they're like. But um as you're saying, there's not really many people putting their hands up and um saying I want that number 13 jersey, 14 jersey, 15 jersey. And um, 
it might get worrying down the line for for Dublin, but um, yeah, I can't I can't see anybody at the moment stepping in. And Mannion, taking... Mannion, Mannion will feel like a new player, but we might again, you know, given the fact that he took a year out, like so. He, but the chances are we won't we won't see him probably. He might play the last game or two, maybe. <laughs> if <laughs> if the Kilmacud <laughs> thing gets ever gets a resolution, then that'll definitely inject a little more potency to that attack. Um, but I'd say, like, if you were picking the Dublin starting 15 for championship, you'd probably be able to pick 14 of them, probably, right now. Yeah, yeah like, but that's okay. Yeah, that's fine. Like, I, I, I <laughs> yeah. take the point. I yeah. was saying earlier, like, that they're, you know, they're still very reliant on Brian Fenton. They'd be reliant on Brian Fenton until he's 35. Like, yes, he's, yeah. he's one of the greatest players ever Kenny, yeah. play the game. Um, yeah, so yeah. that's fine. It's the it's the, it's the middle it's the middle cohort that you're looking at. Can they generate competition among themselves to push it on to a level? It's like the likes of Lee Gannon, who's come through in the last couple of years. Larkin O'Dell. <laughs> yeah, so that that, really that, that level. All good players, and it's just it's just what level can they get to? Mm. Um, so like you're right, like they'll they'll do enough to get through, um, and they'll target. I would imagine that's why Fenton was playing was Kildare. So you want to yeah. keep your you want to keep the locals down. They'll want to keep me down. Um, and then they'll see after that, then see see kind of what they need on a given weekend and who's available and all the rest of it. And like obviously they're they're loading up as well, I'd imagine, this time of the year. So, you know, there'll be yeah. fellas tired and you know, things we want. And the Sigerson is still ongoing. They've the got quite a few, yeah. they've Absolutely. got quite a few lads attached to that. So yeah, mm. you'd be trying to manage loads and work loads. Yeah. Um look at the division one then. Um a week's a long time in politics, Mick. It's a very long time in Division One football. I think going into the first round of games, we we're kind of saying, uh, Tyrone, you know, solid, you know, they're, they're going to, they'll bounce back from last year. And we're like, oh, Donny Gall, you know, Jesus could be a long year for them. Now they're meeting in Healy Park now yeah. on, on Sunday. And um, Donny Gall have the spring in their step and people are beginning to look at Tyrone and say, you know, w- what lies beneath? And uh, there's yeah. a concern with a few people that, you know, the depth isn't there considering, as I said on Monday, considering the club scene in Tyrone, the idea that perhaps they're lacking a little bit in squad depth would be surprising to some. And whereas their neighbours um, kind of uh, silenced a few doubters at the weekend, albeit um, first round of the league, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. First round of the league on a squally day in Paddy Buffet, like, I mean, it was, you know, but it was a very good point that Paddy McBrearty got to win that match, lads. Mm. Jesus Christ above. Like, it was... It, I mean, that would, if that happened in, I was going to say July, but I can say April now or May or whatever, <laughs> you'd be, you'd be, you know, you'd just be, you'd, you'd just be, you know, astounded by it. It was such a score. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the Tyrone one is interesting. The Tyrone one is, is interesting. I was up there a couple of weeks ago uh, meeting Niall Sludden and, and you got the sense that, you know, they hadn't had a, a prolonged break, these players, for quite a while. COVID accepted, but like, you know, a proper away time club and everything and and they felt that you know they had a bit of a break and they were kind of ready to go i met him before the mckenna cup final where they had a bad fade out as well in that in that match and then they kind of faded away again but like again roscommon and tyrone is a funny one like roscommon and tyrone have had some right good matches down the years um there have been some there's been some uh, my memory says it's been a couple of hammerings as well but roscommon have been quite competitive with tyrone at different times in the league and stuff and stuff like that so it, it wouldn't have been First win, since, first win since 2003, you know. Been beat them. Is. Yeah, in, first the first time Ross Common beat them, Dar- I was the, the fair play to Darry. He had it in his commentary fair play. last I Sunday night, but I checked it. it was the, <laughs> the 2nd of February, the 2nd of February, 2003. So today is the uh, anniversary. Oh, my God. Well, I, I had the sense, I had the sense from watching from being at Ross Common throwing games down the years in the league. That, you know, it was it was always competitive, but I'll take the, I'll take that. <laughs> <laughs> just, just wipe. They were narrow. The, they were narrow defeats. <laughs> narrow uh, I don't defeats. know. I don't know. But I'm starting to doubt myself entirely now. But they put, um, them, they put it, it up a very to good them in a super eight in a super eight game. I think in, on on, a, on an occasion. Yeah, it was it was a very good result for them. I, but it does look. It's anything when you come off such a poor championship as Tyrone had last year. Until you start winning again and winning in a way that kind of satisfies yourself first of all before the public. Um, there's the questions are going to linger, but like they. I, I don't know. I'd, I'd still be wary of them. I'd still be wary of them. And Donegal, it was it would look. It was a result that they they probably needed. And it was great to hear actually on the way down. I was at I was at Galway Mayo on Saturday night, and I was on the way back down on Sunday afternoon, and just listening to the coverage on the radio and the interview with Paddy Carr was great. You know, Fantastic. just to, just that just the sheer happiness and the 
the joy and just yeah, it was great. It was Here, great. Here's a good one. Um, I believe it's a, a sellout, which is absolutely no surprise, David, because when it comes to <laughs> GA supporters, uh, Armagh and Mayo uh, enthusiasm is hard to top. But the Athletic Grounds is no longer the Athletic Grounds. Have you heard of who the new name naming sponsor of the it's Athletic Grounds is? Box it. Box it. Yeah. <laughs> it's brilliant. Box it. A very interesting moniker for. Uh... As, as Niall McCoy, an Armagh man, said, he's allowed to say it. He says, if the cap fits. <laughs> um, so... <laughs> but. Um, David, just uh, aside from the, you can see why it's a sellout for a lot of reasons. A, as we mentioned, the mad fan bases and enthusiasm. But, you know, uh, two teams, you, you can see this being a good matchup, especially uh, like early in the league when like Mayo's frantic matches tend to be even more frantic early in the uh, early in the season. Um, this one could be a bit of a bit of a belter, you'd like to think. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um, the way Mayo set up there last weekend against Galway was a cracking game. The second half was a... It was a, it was a pure like uh, arch rivals battling away to each other, uh, Galway and Mayo. But um, no, Mayo kind of I know under Kevin McStay he brought a different kind of style of football to it. And um, you see, will they bring leave Killian O'Connor and uh, um who sorry Killian O'Connor Aidan O'Shea brought him off the bench at the end. Is that mm. going to be the plan for the year? Um. But as I said, they're they're trying out they're trying out players in Mayo, and uh, no better time to try them out than in the national league. Um, but they'll have to travel to uh, box it, <laughs> box it at <Atlanta, laughs> yeah. the grounds. But uh, which is a, a very tough. Maybe, maybe tough that's place. where they should send Katie Taylor. Uh, <laughs> hey. <laughs> but um, uh, yeah, going up going up to Armagh is, is always is tough to play in. Um, they're they're diehard supporters up there in uh, in Ulster and. They always they love they love the football up there. Football is number one to them up there, and um, it's going to be a tough battle. Um, I just I, I probably see Armagh probably pipping it, um, but um, it will be it will be a tight game. It will indeed. Um, and then Rory, ground. Uh, it's a fantastic ground, by the way. It's oh, it is my it's favorite place. GA That's ground. It's nice, it's yeah. It's just it's it's, it's, it's such a perfect a, size. It's just a perfect size in yeah. terms You're of You're close to the supporters and all that. The facilities are really good <laughs> from a TV perspective. It's yeah. it's no, it's a brilliant place. Um we, we we won't go too far into the game by game now stuff. I actually just wanted to get your David, it was mentioned there by Mick a few minutes ago, kind of loading up, and it's something that I think fans are kind of this time of year, they don't know what to read into, say, a performance or a result because they don't really know how much work has been done, you know, in terms of in terms of training. And um, we have a piece running on the RT website this weekend from uh, SNC coach Mike McGarn, and he just kind of kind of goes into a good bit of detail about what exactly teams will be doing. Those are back since September, or October, and whatever, and kind of the aerobic work they've done, moving into anaerobic, but like. It's kind of it's what you're looking for, I guess. And wonder how was it under Colin Collins? Because you'd imagine you would have been targeting the league to a good extent to kind of stay in it, as you say, get a couple of results early. And just how was that balanced with the SNC training? And like now with this new condensed season, teams are obviously going to have to do a little bit more training, probably to kind of maintain their peak for championship. And it's it's it seems to be a very different, difficult balancing act. So I was just wondering how was it yourselves and Claire in the last few years? Did did things change? as the calendar became more condensed uh of course it did yeah but um i think we were very lucky in there with uh, with, with uh, rob mulcahy uh he's carry man um but um he was brilliant i think <laughs> i think he extended my career anyway for definitely two <laughs> or three more years anyway that's for sure um but no he was he was brilliant like you load up um say in the, the winter months and then as, once you get closer to the national league and games you're doing two sessions you probably uh uh, go down to one session, uh, one session a week. It all depends on your body as well. The older players, the younger players, get to do different sessions. Um, I've always said, I said the, the younger players these days, they're they're very lucky to come into this. Uh, like S and C coaches were very rare back when, when I started off fifteen years ago. I wish I had a Rob McCahy <laughs> or Michal Cahill back then. Um, but we did have Mike McGurn down um, under Michal McDermott. He actually came down for a year. So um, that was my first taste of um, an SSC coach, but it is it's 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 a tricky one to tricky one to to figure out. Um, but it's uh, it's it's great to have an SNC coach that he knows what to do. Managers listen to him. That's the most the key thing is if the managers listen to him and let him do what they want to do. 
then that's the, the good thing about it. But some managers mightn't and they go off on their own tangent. That's where that's that's where the injuries come, I suppose. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, it's 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 great to have one. Yeah. Uh, well, one of the things I'm curious about is how do you measure a successful one against a, a not so successful? Like, what's the gauge? What's the barometer around if you bring in an SNC coach? Obviously, they play a very key role, but I, I find it difficult to understand how you assess whether or not they're successful in their role or whether or not it's like, how do you actually put a value on the barometer around or a barometer around the impact that certain SNC coaches have over others? This guy's really good. This guy's really bad. How, how, how is that? Uh, you know, well, I would imagine the amount of games Claire won in the last five minutes is probably an indicator <laughs> for you guys, wasn't it? Yeah, it just well, that's, I, go on. sorry. Uh, that, yeah, that's that's for us. It would have been uh, the fitness. Our fitness was um, Rob had us in brilliant shape. Um, we were flying a fit, uh, and we were finishing games. But is there very data strong. that you can get? To like, oh, there would, yeah. Like, Rob or is would. it just a case of like looking at a horse and saying, "Oh, geez, they're going well there now. Like, he's, <laughs> doing, he's doing a great job." You know, I I don't know. I I find that whole area. Slightly um, baffling, I suppose. Really, as well. Yeah, well, I suppose he'd have the GPSs. You'd have the GPSs on your back, ah, and he yeah, tracks. Yeah, yeah, he tracks yeah. everything that right. what a corner forward should be doing, a, a wing forward, a midfielder, what distance they should be traveling, um, to, like the the sprints you do um, in a, in a corner forward area. This is the, where we want you to do. You're doing too many sprints out here and there, yeah. all that. But he can check all that, and he can give you your feedback and tell you what to do and. Um, I suppose it goes by injuries as well. And um, like I suppose a good SNC coach, you're not going to have that many injuries. And um, I suppose that's the difference between it. I suppose for me, and it would be a good or bad one. <laughs> yeah, soft tissue injuries is key. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Make for us is uh, us great kind of ignoramuses in the in the crowd, whether the press box or in the general seats. Sometimes you, this time you you don't quite know what to believe and how much to take, and a good result can you you, you know you're doubting it because you're like oh maybe oh geez the other crowd look like you know they had the legs run off from during the week. It does it kind of adds to the intrigue slash pointlessness of the league, shall we say? <laughs> a, a little bit, but I think it's different with the football, slightly, in the fact that there is there is a bit to be played for, uh, yeah. in most matches in the football now. I would still say if you're in Division One, there is a little bit of leeway. And it's like you don't want to get relegated, but you're not going to lose out in your Sam McGuire status. So you know there's a little bit there. But by and large, it's more. So like, well, Mick, are- Mick, would you not? Would you not think that if a team goes really well, let's say for argument's sake, Armagh, take Armagh. Yeah, yeah. If Armagh go and win the league, and there's a big hullabaloo about Armagh, and next thing, all of a sudden, the engine blows and they completely tank in yeah, the championship. Yeah. Which is kind of what has happened to the hurling yes. league. Like yeah. w- the point I'm making is, we are very much in ground zero of this new calendar. So there is a danger here. <clears throat> would you think that, like, the assessment around teams' priorities towards the national leagues could become altered in time? I pr- possibly, but we can only look at, like, say, last year, Kerry won it and they went on to win in All Ireland. Yeah. So. That correlation that's been there for quite a while between league and championship still holds up for now. I'm not saying oh, you're like I'm not. It's still the same, like we said at the top in, in the hurling conversation. Like I was saying, the closer we get to finding out who wins the football league, the less interest there'll be, mm. because we'll be looking at it going, "Well, do you really want to? You mm. know, where are you, does it? What's this really telling us?" But like just in terms of even go send Mayo Galway the other night, right? Because there will be matches. There are matches in the league that you can pick out and go. This does come for something really does come for something. And Mayo Galway would have been one of those, I would have thought, because suddenly you have Mayo at a level, they're neck and neck with Galway, we'll say, on the starting grid, starting out this year, you could say, and to see where they were both were at, and they really went after it. Uh, and you'll see and you'll see matches like that through through the time. So, yeah, definitely, you're still looking at it going, well, I don't know what we saw here, and you always have to have that, because it is still a warm-up competition, mm-hmm. obviously, with the added edge that it can define where you end up in the championship. But... <laughs> It for most teams, their teams will take will will there'll be moments where they'll they'll change the team up and stuff like that. They're not starting their strongest fifteens day one and going with it. Most teams aren't. Some teams will because mm-hmm. they need that momentum. But I think there's a bit more to the football league in that regard. You can yes. kind of you can well, sort of trust it a bit more. Which, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you can trust it yeah. a bit more. And I go back to that thing with the hurling. You don't have a middle class. 
in football, you have a very vibrant middle class that keeps the whole thing interesting because you got teams in Division 2, 3 who can genuinely aspire to going up to Division 1 or going up to Division 2 mm-hmm. and feel they can compete if they get up there, which is massive. That keeps the thing honest. Yeah. All, the, all that being said, and the fact you did play in the bear pit that was Division 2, I'm, I'm curious, David, was there ever a day you went out and you won handy or maybe you, you won a game that maybe you weren't expected to win and you just kind of got the impression that the other crowd were exhausted. Did, did you ever get that in the league? Did you ever get the impression that that old cliche we have where Asher just said they, they, had, they, they had a heavy session on Saturday so they threw that game all together kind of thing. We hear these kind of things. Is that an impression you would have ever got from playing a team? No, I don't think so because um, like you have the Division 1 uh, where there's a certain few teams up there that they can rest players or they can try it out players and stuff like that where like just say Ross Common who came up last year they have to go full throttle at the start just to, if they want to maintain division one status um then in, the, in division two everybody's fighting for promotion and then there's the three or four teams that are trying to stay up from the division two or d- dropping down to division three so they have to go they have to go all out at start of the year as well um and their focus is the the league and i suppose right now they're not even thinking about championship at the moment it's the division two three teams four teams they want to fight for promotion and um, they want to put in a good performance in the league. Um, and then you you move on afterwards and then you think about the championship once the league finishes. But right now, I'd say, I suppose for 25 teams in the in the, in the the league, uh, um, they're all fighting for either promotion or, or relegation. And I think they have to go strong first out. Yeah, we're just hammering more nails into the hurling league here. Really, is what we're doing <laughs> with our football preview. <laughs> we just we kind we we kind of we kind of knocked it out during the hurling, but now we're just kicking its lifeless body on the ground while yeah. we continue on. So we might Mike, leave it there before Mikey. Mikey, yes. just one just one one point I'd like to make there. As I said earlier, I mean, I went over to Abbottstown last night. Brilliant game and an amazing set. The, ca- the campus really is something else. If people haven't been over there, they should really get over and have a look. It's incredible. But one thing that stood out for me, it's just the timing of this competition. It's wrong. And I think a real opportunity presents itself to higher education. Like If they were to go to the month of November, I know it would present a challenge in terms of exams and the fact a lot of these players, male and female, would only be back in college a month or better a couple of weeks uninterrupted prep than the pockmarked nature that exists now. And so the challenges aren't insurmountable. I think it would fill a huge void. Uh, it may develop a much better following. Uh, there's a real hint at a railway cup off it, very prominent running right way through it, and has a fantastic sense of innovation. Now, I know it'll infringe on the so-called off-season and potentially in some club matches, but by and large, most of the clubs, 90% of the clubs are finished by the month of November. There's only a few that, there's a couple of clubs that will be involved in All-Ireland clubs and provincial clubs, but that's like a tiny number in the grand scheme of things. You'd have a situation where managers are probably less likely to be annoyed at having to give up players. The players themselves were able to focus solely on it. You all do get the odd blow, but it's very competitive for the most part and extremely high level of quality. There was a Kerry lad actually playing last night, a fella called Rory Murphy from the Listry. Oh, that's oh, right. Yeah, he's a fabulous, oh, fabulous player. Good Lord. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if he's not in the Kerry team at some stage over the league, I'd be very, very surprised. I know he was excellent for his Kerry in the club as well. And you may even find TV companies get a lot more interested in it if it's at a time of year when they could be looking for live sport to fill schedules. Um, and the most astonishing thing of all, it was free. Yeah. Some of the yeah. best young footballers you'll see anywhere. They're not for moving, Mick, are they? Well, it's, I, I went down this road, I don't know, was it last year or the year before, um, for similar, for, you know, November looked a good, and I think it might be, it has been suggested over the years. The issue that the third level colleges would have with that, they, by the way, I think that January is actually the time. This is what you hear back from the January is the it is a may, good time. That it might it used to be the time, Mick. But yeah. because of, you know, I, I think that was fine before we went to the calendar that we have now. And I think they may yeah. you know get slightly more so, imaginative around this. Sorry. Yeah, no, I grant so like the but the practical problem for them is like uh going back to college, you're back what mid late October. September, October. Yeah. yeah. So like you just don't have time to get a squad together. That's essentially it. Or you don't have time to even get matches in before you're plunged into the biggest competition of your year but you'd have them uninterrupted at that time though Mick like you wouldn't necessarily like the way they have them now 
they're probably in with the county one week and then they're yeah. out with the, the, the college. Whereas in, in the month of October, leading into the competition, if they were ran off in the month of November, they'd probably have the players um, uninterrupted access. Possibly. Again, I just, I mean, what the, what was said back to me was that they just wouldn't have a sense of their squad. You also have guys coming into the college maybe for the first time. Fellas, you know, they use the leagues to have a look at fellas who have come in as well, who may not have been there last year to see can they move in. So just... Their, their attitude is with the preparation, with the prep time, it would just be too condensed to get a proper, you know, to get their teams right and ready for Fitzgibbon and Sigerson in November. Yeah. Um, but maybe, maybe there's ways around it. I, I, I don't know, but that's that's definitely was the vibe I got from the higher education teams, from from, from guys who were involved with higher education teams, third was level it, teams. Was then. it a big issue got, uh, with Claire David? Would have been, you know, obviously, you'd have a lot of younger squad members not available early stages yeah. of the league and stuff like that like your your training numbers would be down um, if you want to play a challenge game they wouldn't be around for it but um, just on uh, Clare and the UL team they're, they're into the final uh, next week but like you've got Emmett McMahon who played Wednesday he played Sunday against um, Laut he's played I think he played Wednesday again uh, uh, against uh, was it uh, uh, University of Galway Eight so it's football yeah, like he played, he played every minute of the, the Clare game as well. So that's three games within within a week, and it's it's tough on young fellas, I suppose. I think I think you could be right with. I know um, they're only back to college and stuff like that in October, but I think probably November, uh, November early December. Like, I think there'd be an appetite for it as well because yeah. you have to bear in mind you'd be landing this in at a time of the year when there's such a dearth of high quality GA action, given the fact that the intercounty season will be finished about five yeah. months at that stage. <laughs> yeah, but he used to have a pretty free run at January, Rory, and uh, did, yeah. I used to work at the Daily Mail, who were sponsors. No of interest. It. It doesn't. It doesn't get much traction in the national press. So proper no. guys like us, like you know, your 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 GA diehards are there watching the streams on a Tuesday, or Wednesday. I don't know if that was on TG Cahar or RTE or Virgin that it would draw big crowds. I really don't. I think it's a it's a niche thing and it's very high quality and everything else. But people don't really get behind colleges, you know. It's the thing. I tell you, I tell you what. If the preseason competitions in football didn't exist. No, there'd be, maybe, a, yeah. there'd be a lovely think, gap there, or certainly for the for the for the Sigerson. I think yeah. also I think I think uh the Fitzgibbon and Sigerson takes about six weeks to run off. Yeah. It's a fair old lump now. Yeah. Mm. So like so again, they have a round robin, into, they they start with a round robin and then they move to yeah. that period, so. so like if you put it into November, you are walking straight into exams for the guys who are still who are, who are still involved at the top end of it. And mm. if you push it back, you're into October and they're only back. I, I, I just oh, yeah. I just don't think autumn. I don't think autumn really works for January is the time. Like it was December for donkey's years mm, up to the sixties yeah. or the seventies or something. And then they moved it to January. Um, and that does, I mean, just from, from it's a, it comes up every single year and it always, it seems that January, February is probably the right time for, I do think if the preseason competition didn't exist, you, you know, we, we, you do know what we need. Obviously we need a 13th month. That's just, yeah. that, that's what the GA yeah. needs. It would just yeah. be just, just perfect. Go back into bloody August. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no, that's it. That's a good sign. Listen, <laughs> watch, uh, watch Cork and Limerick on your televisions on Saturday, on Saturday evening and listen to Saturday and Sunday sport and get all your reports and reaction and analysis on the RT sport website website in the RTE News app. Thank you, David. Thank you, Mick. Thank you, Rory. And thank you to Jackie earlier. And we will be back with you on Monday. Good luck Possession and goodbye. How much longer will the referee allow? Dublin lead by a point. And there's the whistle. It's over. It's over. We earned it by winning the last two matches on the road. And that's not going to be taken away from us. But what I love in Hurling, I love players that will never give in. He hits it. He hits it. It's over the bar. Oh, holy Moses. 